So it was early October in the mid-Atlantic and a small sailing vessel was bobbing up and down like a cork. And the strong and powerful winds that were common that time of year aboard were approximately 130 souls of which 102 were heading to the northern parts of the Virginia colony in order to plant a settlement for their families in a reasonable degree of peace and safety. For a number of years, this group of separatists, as they were called, had traveled from place to place looking for somewhere where they could worship God according to the dictates of their conscience and according to the scriptures as they understood and applied them. They had been persecuted by the Church of England because they would not worship in the way that the Church of England had prescribed. And this desire to flee persecution in England initially took them to Holland. As they settled there, they became acutely aware of the impact of the culture on their family. Not necessarily that it was the Dutch culture, but it was the corruption that was going on in Holland at the time. And they saw the, the impact that that was having on their families. And so they sought out another place, another place in the New World. So now these pilgrims found themselves transiting the treacherous North Atlantic in a tiny vessel barely big enough to carry them and the supplies that they would need to get through that first winter. By the time they completed the crossing, the storms had pushed them north out of the region of the Virginia colony where they were supposed to be settling to a place called Cape Cod. Wintry conditions had already begun to set in. So urgently they began building some shelter. Some would stay on the Mayflower for several months while the compound was being built. Of the 102 that arrived in the Plymouth Harbor on December 16th, 1620, only 52 would survive to see the spring. With, many of the, with as many as two to three dying per day during the first few months that they were there. However, through it all, one thing that sustained them was their strong belief in the sovereignty of the Lord. They were convinced that the Lord in his providence had brought them to this land. And they were determined to honor him in the settlement of this new colony. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 say, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Yet in the midst of those desperate times, what could they be thankful for? And everything give thanks, but what could they be thankful for? For the past several weeks, we've been spending our time in the Psalms, focusing on the theme of worshiping the Lord because the character of God compels us to acknowledge His greatness. In Psalm 95, we saw the connection between worship and the hardness of the human heart as worship guards us against, the hard, against a hardened heart. In Psalm 96, we learned about worship and the salvation of the Lord that goes throughout all the earth. 
In Psalm 97, we discovered that worship takes place in concert with the judgment of God. And we saw that relationship between worship and judgment. In Psalm 98, we witnessed how worship compels us to celebrate the victory of the Lord. From Psalm 99, we saw last week that that we worship God because of his exalted holiness. This morning, we turn our attention to the last and the shortest of the Psalms in our series, Psalm 100. This Psalm, in many ways, provides a nice closing bracket to our series. Psalm 95, the opening bracket, as it were, focused on the hardness of the heart, but this psalm focuses on a thankful heart. As with all of the psalms in this series, it draws our attention away from ourselves and our circumstances toward the sovereignty and goodness of the Lord. It takes us out of our ordinary places and into his holy courts. It takes us from our homes and into his throne room. It removes us from the place of despair and into the place of joyful singing. This psalm reminds us that a thankful heart results from a life dedicated to the worship of the Lord. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, as always, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the provisions that you've given us, for the promise that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. We thank you, especially for your word that you have given to us, a word that we were reminded of in Sunday school this morning of how precious it is that we can study it, that we can seek to understand it. Thank you, Lord, that we do not do this on our own, but we can do this with the promise that you would guide us. So as we get into your word, help us to understand what you would have for us. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts that we might be able to develop the thankful heart that this psalm reminds us of. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the first thing we see in verses one through three is this, that the knowledge of the Lord's sovereignty invites us to come serve him joyfully. This is a call that goes throughout all the earth. We sung about this just a moment ago, the song that talks about the word of God going across the lands. Your cry of love rings out across the lands. Again, this is a refrain that is repeated throughout the Psalms that we have been in over the course of this series. This is a call that is not reserved for any certain geographic location. The Lord is not restricted by time and location. He has not limited himself to one particular ethnic group. Unlike many other religions across the world that are clearly culturally distinctive, the call of the Lord goes, out, goes throughout the world, transforming cultures while embracing cultural distinctions. This is why we see peoples from every nation, tribe, language, and people group surrounding the Lord's throne. The people of God are not one culture, but a, unif- a unified collection of different cultures. We are not one language, but a single body of diverse languages. We are not one nation, but a kingdom drawn from every nation. So what do we learn about our relationship with the Lord in verses one through three? 
We see in verses 1 and 2 in particular that our responsibility is to serve the Lord joyfully. What we find in what we find in these two verses are three commands a pattern that we will see re repeated in verse 4 the first command is to shout joyfully the king james and the esv say make a joyful noise i remember when i was little I may have been as young as about five or six years old, I'm guessing. My little sister, Sarah, who has a beautiful singing voice, probably the most musically talented in our family, made, complained about the fact that I couldn't sing. She made a big deal of this. My family would understand the extent that she would make a big deal of, of this. So what did I do? I did something that probably would point to why I'm standing behind this pulpit now. So I, on my own, as a little kid, memorized Psalm 100. And why did I do that? Well, because the Bible says, make a joyful noise, not sing on tune. And so that's why I memorized that psalm. The joyful noise is the sound of celebration. We saw this a few psalms ago. It is the sound of people having a good time, of people enjoying being where they are. It is the sound of people who truly understand their context and their focus. I was watching the beaver game last night, stayed up and watched the, beaver, the beavers play last night. They won. Yes, mom was giving me the what? what? Well, you're going to tell us? Yes, they won. Celebration. The beavers were undefeated at home. And the students stormed the field. You would have thought they won the national championship. It was a joyful noise. It was a joyful sound. You don't do that when you're feeling burdened. You don't feel, you don't do that when you're feeling distraught by the circumstances of the day. Additionally, these are people who not only understand their context and their focus, these are people who are not focused on self, according to our text. They do not see themselves as the source of their hope and peace. Why do I say this from our text? Because these people are called to shout joyfully to the Lord. Of all their joy, all of their joy is directed away from themselves and toward the Lord the people addressed in this psalm. Our ultimate joy is not in ourselves, but in the Lord. Consequently, we are commanded to shout joyfully or to make a joyful noise to whom? To the Lord. Shout joyfully or make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. The next command that we see is to serve the Lord with gladness. Quite often we think, when we think of service, we're called to serve the Lord, we think of service maybe in a couple of ways. We may think of the relationship between a slave and a master, a relationship that's commonly addressed in Scripture. This view takes the perspective of service being drudgery, or demanding. Service is a burden, something that is born out of obligation. It may be something that is wearisome and tiring. While there is a sense in which we are being commanded to serve the Lord in verse 2, we must remember what John writes in 1 John 5, 8 where he says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 
Second, we may think of service connected in the context of service to our communities or service to others. We frequently speak of community service projects or doing something to serve our communities. This view speaks of serving others and meeting other people's needs. We will be doing this with regard to our outreach to, the, to this mom and her kids. Sometimes, however, even these things are done out of a sense of obligation, a sense of duty to our community. However, this psalm calls us to serve the Lord. We are reminded in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Whatever service we render, we must do so without a sense of obligation, but rather with gladness. We are to serve the Lord with gladness. We do it with gladness because ultimately it is the Lord whom we serve. We see another command of verse 2. It says, Come before him with joyful singing. Here we see an invitation to come into the Lord's presence. In one sense, there is a connection between coming into his presence and serving the Lord. To come before the Lord is not simply to come into a church. We'll speak more of that in a little bit. But there seems to be a connection between serving the Lord and coming to the Lord. We're invited to come into the presence of the Lord for the purpose of serving the Lord. We don't come in to get, we come in to serve. The motto of Ligonier Ministries is the Latin phrase, Coram Deo, in the presence of the Lord. It captures the idea of living with a constant awareness of the presence of the Lord. So, to come before the Lord's presence is not simply to walk into a church. It's not simply to come in here. We don't come in here in order to come in to the presence of the Lord. It does not mean walking in to our sanctuary or going to the monastery at Mount Angel Abbey. How many have been up to Mount Angel Abbey? It's incredibly beautiful. Incredibly beautiful. That is not what is meant by coming into the presence of the Lord. It involves more than just some geographic location. Rather, it involves a lifestyle defined by a constant understanding of the presence of the Lord. R.C. Sproul, the founder of Ligonier Ministries, says this, this means if a person fulfills his or her vocation as a steelmaker, attorney, or homemaker, quorum Deo, if you fulfill it in the presence of the Lord, then that person is acting every bit as religiously as a soul-winning evangelist who fulfills his vocation. It means that David was as religious when he obeyed God's call to be a shepherd as he was when he was anointed with the special grace of kingship. It means that Jesus was every bit as religious when he worked in his father's carpenter shop as he was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. End quote. What this psalm reminds us of is that we are to come into the Lord's presence joyfully. The Lord calls us to serve and we are to do so with joy. 
So if our responsibility is to serve the Lord joyfully, what is our reason? Why do we do this? Why do we serve the Lord joyfully? We see in verse 4, the reason is because we know the Lord is sovereign. The first line of the verse says, know that the Lord himself is God, or know that the Lord, he is God. This is a statement of exclusivity. The Lord is God and there is no other God. He commands all that there is. The psalmist goes on to say, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. We like to think we are the commanders of our own ships, the authors of our own destinies. We are self-made. However, we are reminded that God is our creator. He is the only one without origin. He is the only one who is eternal. He is the creator of all things, including us. Another rendering of this statement says, it is he who made us and we are his. This communicates the truth that we owe our obligation to him. We belong to the Lord and not to ourselves. Paul reminds us in Romans 14, verses 7 and 8, for, for not one of us lives for himself and not, or, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Connected to this is the idea that we are the flock that the Lord shepherds. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The image of the Lord as a shepherd is one that is very common throughout all of scripture. However, today when we hear this term sheep, it's a disparaging remark. We don't like being called sheep. As a matter of fact, it tends to refer to people who don't think for themselves, people who don't have their own minds. We hear two words that are mentioned in our psalm. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We hear these two words, people and sheep, pushed together and refer to people as sheeple. Yet the reality is that we are sheep under the guidance and protection of our great shepherd. In John 10, Jesus uses this to describe himself. He says of his sheep, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 27 and 28. A thankful heart is a real result of a life dedicated to worship, first of all, because the knowledge of the Lord's sovereignty invites us to come serve him joyfully. Yet we see something else in this psalm. Once more, we see the combination of responsibility and reason, the what and the why. An invitation has been extended like a card in the mail to come into the palace of the king. Together we have been summoned into his presence. Once more we are called to leave our humdrum lives behind and go to the place where we can enjoy the presence of the one who alone is good. The final two verses of this psalm remind us that the, in, that the enduring goodness of the Lord invites us to come before him thankfully. The 
the first thing that we see in these last couple of verses is that our responsibility is to come before the Lord with thankfulness. Verse four invites us to enter his gates with thanksgiving. The imagery here is that of an Israelite during the height of the kingdom. Solomon is the king and the temple that God commissioned him to build is now complete. Imagine being one of those Israelites. Perhaps you have traveled from a ways away as you trudge up the mountain to Jerusalem, the excitement and anticipation build as you approach this magnificent wonder. You've heard of its construction and all that went into it. Much time and effort has gone into building this magnificent temple, and now you are going to come worship the Lord in this most glorious of locations. Imagine what it would have been like. As you approach the temple gates, you see doors more ornate than you had imagined. The level of detail defies description. Along with a host of other worshipers, you pass through the gateway and come into the outer court. Standing before you is the temple. In front are the steps leading up to the place where the daily sacrifices are offered. Beyond that is the temple itself. Bronze pillars mark the entrance to the holy place where only select priests are allowed to go. You are in the courtyard of the Lord. How do you respond? At times, the appropriate response is repentance and mourning. However, the people of the Lord are also invited to come before him with thanksgiving. Remember, he is our God, and we are his people. We are his sheep, protected and provided for by the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-caring God. When we come before him, we are invited to come into his presence with thanksgiving, to enter his courts with praise. Our worship is to be to him. It is for him. For he provides for, for us all that we need. Philippians 4, 6 reminds us, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Verse 2 of Psalm 95, the very psalm that opened the series that we are in, reminds us of the same thing we see here in Psalm 100. It says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. How many of us, when we come before the Lord in prayer, do so bringing only our cares and concerns? We should. But so often we only bring to the Lord those things that worry us or burden us But when we do so, do we remember to find reason to be thankful to our God? Even in those times where we are burdened. You might ask, why should I be thankful? Why? I'm burdened, I'm tired, I'm sick, I'm weary. Life is tough. My family is falling apart. We're having a hard time meeting 
give, we're having a hard time making ends meet. Why should I be thankful? The reason is because we know the Lord's enduring goodness. Verse 5 says, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. The very definition of the character of God is his goodness. God is the ultimate example of all that is good. God is good in his mercy and grace, but God is also good in his judgment and wrath. He isn't good sometimes and not good at other times. The fullness of who God is, is good. God does not stop being any of the qualities that he is. If God is unendingly good, then we should have unending reasons for giving thanks to the Lord. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness extends through all generations. So if you look back at your life, I'm certain all of us could recognize that God has been good to us at times. I know all of us could look back and point to places where God has been good. But could we honestly say that God has been good all the time. Would we honestly find his faithfulness to be enduring? You look back at the difficult times that you've had, those hard times. Could you look at those hard times and say, God is good? God was good. Would you honestly find his faithfulness to be enduring? If not, how hard are we looking if we can't see it in the hard times? How well do we really understand the goodness of God if we only see it in the good times? God is good all the time. And all the time, he is worthy of us coming before his presence with thanksgiving. It was late October, 1621. The pilgrims had endured their first harsh winter that had seen their numbers cut nearly in half. The spring had brought renewed hope with the help of two natives who not only knew the land and how to grow the crops, but also knew English. Throughout the summer and into the autumn, the Lord had provided for them abundantly, and they were able to store away enough food to get them through the coming winter. Or so they thought. The fall also brought to their port the first ship from England, the Fortune. And with it, 35 more of their number who had been unable to make the voyage with them on the Mayflower. Their initial joy soon turned to concern when they realized that these new settlers brought with them no provisions, no clothing, no tools, no bedding, nothing. Additionally, as they took stock of their food, they realized at best they would barely have enough to make, to make it through that coming winter, the second winter. 
And they would only be able to do so if they went to half rations. Things would get so bleak that by some accounts they would get down to a daily ration of five kernels of corn per person. Imagine five kernels of corn per person. In the 1880s, or in the 1800s, a devout Christian author and poet by the name of Hezekiah Buttersworth, Hezekiah Butterworth, wrote the following poem about that winter. In some places, it became a tradition to read this poem. Here's what Hezekiah Butterworth wrote. "'Twas the year of the famine in Plymouth of old, the ice and snow from the, thatch roofs, from the thatched roofs had rolled. Through the warm purple skies steered the geese o'er the seas, and the woodpeckers tapped in the clocks of the trees, and the boughs on the slopes to the south winds lay bare, and dreaming of summer the buds swelled the air. The pale pilgrims welcomed each reddened morn. There, there were left but for rations, five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn. But to Bradford, a feast were five kernels of corn. Five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn, ye people be glad for five kernels of corn. So Bradford cried out on bleak hill, and the thin women stood in their doors, white and still. Lo, the harbor of Plymouth rolls bright in the spring. The maples grow red, and the wood robins sing. The west wind is blowing and fading the snow. The pleasant pines sing, and buttresses blow. Five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn. To each one be given five kernels of corn. O oh, Bradford of Osterfield, hast, haste on the way. The west winds are blowing o'er Provincetown Bay. The white avens bloom. The pine domes are chill. The new graves have furrowed precisioner's hill. Give thanks, all ye people, the warm skies have come, the hilltops are sunny, the green grow and green grows the home, and trumpets of winds, and the white march is gone, and ye still have left you five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn, ye have for thanksgiving five kernels of corn. The raven's gift eat and humble and pray. The light is breaking and truth leads your way. One taper a thousand shall kindle. Rejoice that you have been given the wilderness voice. O oh, Bradford of Osterfield, daring the wave and safe through the sounding blasts, lead, leading the brave of deeds such as thine, was the free nation born, and the festal world sings of five kernels of corn. Five kernels of corn, five kernels of corn, the nation gives thanks for five kernels of corn to the Thanksgiving feast bring five kernels of corn. So as we conclude this morning, I hope everyone got this, and so here's your homework. Before you eat the candy corn, Dad. Dad, Dad is a connoisseur of candy corn. So this week, whether you eat the candy corn or not, take some time and fill this out. Your homework is to find five things that I thank God for. Not five things that I thank my mom for or my siblings for. Five things that I thank God for. One for each kernel of corn. 
Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we have much to be thankful for. We are reminded of your goodness. We are reminded of your presence. We are reminded that you are ever with us. You have not abandoned us, even though times may seem difficult and hard. We are reminded by your Apostle Paul to give thanks in everything. God, we thank you that we can come into your presence. We thank you that we can do so joyfully. God, I pray that you would capture our hearts and may we as your people ever and always find reason to be thankful for all of your good and precious gifts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.